my name is Lelovsky. I represent the IT Association of Slovakia and I, I would ask an, an open question. In these days or in the past months we've been monitoring the initiative of European Commission named Digital Single Market and Digital Transformation of Companies. In my view, these are one of few reasonable and positive activities of European Commission which rather open the markets or have this ambition to open the market. But the fact that even after 20 years of the European Union, almost nothing is really open and we haven't made it so far and now we want to digitalize it. I don't think this is the most reasonable solution, but still it's better at least to try to do something. However, according to surveys, uh, among Slovak entrepreneurs and businesses, uh, they are struggling for survival. The rule of law to get uh, your invoices paid, get for paid for your services, to get less pressure from bureaucracy, bureaucracy from institutions, and their ideas, innovative ideas to improve processes, digitalizations are probably uh, not among priorities. It's in the it's less than tenth place of their priorities and I believe that solar companies this will rather be to their detriment than to help them and those developed countries like Britain, Germany and others where companies have already been through this digital transformation they will uh, make progress and be ahead of us to cut it short I believe it's not quite fair to create a digital single market for weak countries even with weaker companies and if we don't help this and if we stop helping only to marketing startups or uh, marketing institutions, we pour a lot of money to them who do research for nothing. And unless we help real businesses, then all these topics like digital market or digital transformation will serve for nothing and will rather harm us. Okay. The, the width or the breadth of the question is very, very large. So I'll try to be very brief. Uh, so, if we're talking about digitalization of government services, then yes, we should do that and we should do it properly because there is a good way to do e-government and then there is a bad way to do e-government. The good way to do e-government is it actually works, the databases are compatible and you know, you digitalize everything and you end up with fewer bureaucrats and everything works smoother. So that's a good way. And usually how it is done, at least in my experience, is in a bad way. So basically, you add a bunch of databases which do not communicate between each other, which are incompatible, and instead of reducing the number of bureaucrats, you have to hire 100,000 more IT guys who actually could work out how these systems, how systems work. So yes, e-government, we should definitely do that and do it in a good way. Now, another portion of digital single market is, uh, well, creating sort of European Googles and things like that. And I think that's a definitely European Commission getting not into the business of not their own. Well, let's say the business of, uh, of the business of search engines. It's not a uh, it's not a business of uh, of European of European Union European Commission. Don't fix that something that worked great. I mean, uh, so basically, EU or the governments should should stick to what governments do, providing public services, not creating a, a sort of these grotesque copies of, of successful businesses, so that would be my opinion. I think there are lots of other barriers that need to be broken down as well. I mean, I think, for example, uh, the services market is still very incomplete across Europe. And, you know, if you have an e-commerce market, someone can buy a product from, say, a Slovakian can buy a product from the UK, but the delivery service is very hard to get united. So if you can't have a proper delivery service across the continent, um, or it's not easy to go into other markets, um, it kind of defeats the point. So I think there are lots of other barriers that they have to break down along with if they want to make this uh, digital single market work properly. Um, hello, my name is Václav Bazovský, Fedrik Naman Foundation. I have a question to what Mr. Mekos said about the convergence and the rates of, of different states from, from the Central and Eastern Europe. Um, you said that some countries fare better, obviously, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, none of the countries reach the EU average. Um, uh, I, I think we are still in the range between 80 to 90 percent of GDP. Are you not afraid that we are now, in a way, trapped in this in this ratio and some, some, some scholars call it middle income trap, I don't know if this that's the right time, but anyway, are you not afraid that we uh, are not really move, moving forward um, in the near, near future? 
countries like Central European countries are now, if you are speaking, for instance, about uh, World Economic <coughs> Forum Global Competitiveness Index, these countries, at least Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, Estonia, are among so-called innovation-driven countries. It means these countries are relatively developed by GDP per capita. They are not because the, the developing countries are factor-driven and then efficiency-driven. And these relatively high-level countries are dependent. Their, their further growth is dependent on the innovation. That's the reason why they name innovation-driven countries. But if you look at the score, for instance, of, of Slovakia, you can see that especially in the areas which are crucially important for innovation-driven, we are even worse than our overall score. Uh, in my opinion, what is the most important, there are three groups of factors to be successful and not to be trapped in, the, in this, in this middle-income trap. First one, we have to have uh, macroeconomic stability, which means sustainable public finance, long-term sustainable public finance. Second group of preconditions is good and <coughs> permanently improved business environment. Third one is effective uh, regulation and public service, effective public sector. And fourth one is knowledge society, education, science, research, innovation. And the problem is that only reforms and progress in all these four areas can bring really positive prospects and, and perspective to, 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 to not be captured in, the, in this, in this uh, middle-income trap. And if we look, for instance, in Slovakia, we can see some progress in some areas. Yes, we, we are, government is reducing fiscal deficit, but unfortunately, by such a way which is not sustainable for the future. But in all other three areas, we don't see progress. On the contrary, we see at least stagnation, even, even some, some, some worsening. Which means, yes, this middle income trap is a real risk for these countries. Um, it, it seems to me, looking from the outside, uh, it was very interesting to hear um, there's a, still a 25% gap to, to Austria in terms of, in terms of GDP, if I understand cor correctly. Now, I showed you a, a graph showing um, uh, Denmark's relative economic wealth compared to some European countries and the US. And in Denmark, a lot of um, apologies of the welfare state and the way we've done things uh, say, look, we're not falling further behind the US than we are already. A lot, uh, but we, we have permanently been 20% behind the US for 100 years. Now, is that satisfactory? If we think we're great, well, I think we're great. Why should we accept being permanently 20% behind the Americans? Is there any reason for that? And it's even worse when we, when we compare to Scandinavians in the US, they earn 40% more than Scandinavians in Scandinavia. Now, why is that? Uh, so, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, I think it's a question of ambition. You know, why, why should Slovakia be 25% less wealthy than Austria? I don't see any reason why that should, should be, uh, be your ambition. You should have have the ambition to uh, get on par with the best in the world. Thank you for the floor. My name is Lubomir Ply. I will ask a question, but before that, I would like to elaborate on one thing for a while. Ivan Miklos said with regard to the reforms, uh, he said that political leadership was very important. And I believe that this leadership as such has two other attributes. The first one, is a visionary leadership and the other one is a leadership which supports ethics and morals in the management of the society in order to achieve some vision which we had and our vision was clear 26 years ago we all wanted freedom democracy and rule of law unfortunately it seems to me that it all narrowed down only to the political leadership and the visionary aspect of the leadership uh, got to the margin. There's no room, there's no forum to confront political reality, political leadership with the 
specific content of the vision which was clear to us and which uh, uh, slowly disappeared. And then the absence of ethics and morals when decisions are taken. It is uh, reflected and uh, then the distortion of the content is uh, reflected in the corruption, political criminality uh, which govern in the country. But when I uh, checked out the web page uh, with regard to the, this conference, I saw the name of the presentation of the panelist from Denmark, Mr. Garup, and uh, the way it was uh, was some kind of sounded kind of funny. We constipated, so we managed to uh, go through the reforms as if we were constipated by the reforms. We were unable to digest them, and we're we have a full belly, and we don't know what to do with it. So I believe the question is. What do the panelists think about the influence of effective, stable and professional public administration or public service on competitiveness and on the growth of economy? Because I believe that it's elementary that there's a co correlation in every country, successful country, which is more competitive. So there's this correlation. The more efficient the government is, that means public administration, the more competitive is the country. Is that true or am I wrong? Well, a few brief comments, Mr. Ply. You said that a part of leadership should be a vision and a visionary leadership. I mentioned in my speech that I consider uh, as political leadership, uh, political leaders who have the vision, the will and the courage to implement the vision. I don't think that we did not have a vision uh, when we changed the social and economic model in Slovakia and we changed it in a way we considered it to be right on the basis of the vision which we had. Obviously, there can be discussions about whether the vision was right or not. I believe it was and the economic result are the evidence of that. The second question concerns the ethics, the moral and corruption. One of the colleagues showed a slide about institutional economy, about formal and informal rules. It's very important. Formal rules are the laws, regulations, legislation which we changed. Formal rules can be changed in a country, in a post-communist country in 10, 15 years. That's what we did. Informal rules these are voluntarily shared values and they change only with the change of generations. The consequences of distorted formal and informal rules by tens of years of communism and before the Nazi, the fascist regime, it was impossible to change them uh, in a speedy way. By this, I don't want to say that we should not combat corruption, we should fight even more against corruption, but it's an illusion to think that in countries with such distorted formal but especially informal rules that in course of a few years we can come to a situation like in Sweden where they have a, an act on free access to information. They have had it since 1863 for, tenth, for many years. They've had stable political and economic conditions based on fair political and economic competition. That means not distorted, both formal or and informal rules. Okay, and a very brief answer to your question about uh, state service. Obviously, but you cannot separate one from the other one. E efficient state service must be must be of high quality, or must be efficient, but relatively cheap, so that we don't have to ha have high taxes. And, ag and again, uh, the status which we inherited from the previous regime could not be changed fast. I don't want to underestimate it, but it's even more important. I think there is the element of that. I have a theory about it. Well, it's not mine, but basically the, the, the theory goes like, you can motivate good people by success, and you can motivate bad people by fear of failure. So I think what, what was happening in a transition, all of us had goals, NATO, EU, and more or less Euro. 
And that was basically the, the stick that drove the politicians to do the correct things because they knew if they fail these, uh, the people will not forgive them, right? So once those have been reached, I think politicians kind of became less constipated and said, well, let's now create our own versions of socialism, which we really wanted to do all the time, but we couldn't. So that's one point. Uh, public sector, absolutely, yes. Efficient, effective public sector is definitely better than a bad public sector. But I would say the influence of public sector towards competitiveness goes through the negative in a sense that bad public sector is a definite drag on competitiveness. I would use it, view it through this lens.